so, by the way, I, I sense that some people could see that maybe we should not be that excited about multi-gigabyte analysis because everybody reports terabytes of logs now, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, especially the 100 CPU hours is also not so much. Uh, well, depending how many times you want to make a round trip and debug everything. So that will be the story about what happens when you are waiting um, a bit of time for each result and definitely much longer than you would like to wait. So uh, basically I will first introduce myself, then the problem, and then my solution. A uh, solution is actually not that complex, but it took a while to get it. So I will tell the story, I hope. I hope it, it will be interesting. So basically my background is that I really wanted to do nature science. It just so happened that I got a first degree in computer science and only a second degree in bioinformatics. And it just so happened that whatever you are doing now, if you're doing it serious enough, uh, including all kinds of science, you are doing programming. And in particular, most of the scientists, especially in like quickly developing natural sciences fields are using or just making computational science anyway. So with this regard, I, I basically tell about problems that probably are common to all computational science. In particular, we have a long debug cycle. So it doesn't really matter whether you have terabytes, gigabytes, or petabytes. But even with the largest grid, you will have some time to wait until your debug cycle completes and you get results. And then you get some kind of statistics that tells you that you fired badly, usually. <laughs> and you need to improve it. So the, the solution to this problem is actually the improving of the programming practice so that we can isolate late bugs quicker we can summarize our uh, runs more effectively and yeah and maybe write tests in some intelligent manner by the way who will write the tests for you yeah so basically uh, when you are doing software development the most familiar paradigms you probably are using is test driven development so that we have tests that have 100% coverage for everything you can predict about the code. If you don't feel like that intelligent as to be able to predict everything that you want your code to do, then people will tell you to do exploratory programming. Yeah, so if you are, for example, you don't know your environment, then you use something like uh, IDE that will hint your autocomplete fragments of code will let you inspect the code while it's running and possibly use something like Jupyter or IPython notebook to actually look what the data is inside because you just get some kind of numbers and possibly a lot of them. And before you look at, at, the, gra look at the graph, you actually don't really know what is inside. So we can discuss it as many ways of data analysis, actually, that just happen to be so difficult that we need to use programs for them. And I'm personally not championing either, so not test-driven development, not exploratory. It just happened that in computational science, most of the time, you don't know what is the result. So you cannot use pure test-driven development. <coughs> you can use exploration, but exploration is much faster when you can test something. So my approach here would be data-driven data development. So we first take the data. We make sure that it's somehow valid. We transform it in different ways to get more meaningful data. And we make sure that it's still valid. And in the process, we should write the tests that help us in, to verify the validity of all results. And why is it very, very different from either approach? I will tell in a minute. So basically, the, the first 
kind of background information that you absolutely need to remember is that human memory capacities or input capacities are rather limited. So you can uh, hear about people telling that you actually process a lot of data, but experiments in memory tell that maybe not all of this data you can consciously process and recall with equal ease. So actually human memory probably associates few kilobytes per second depending how you measure it. So whatever is that you see, after a while you will be able to recollect the facts or relations between this what you observe and only few of them. Only those that made sense when you were analyzing the first input. The second thing is long-term memory is even more limited. According to some experiments, just few pieces of information per day is retained over a long term. So you have a lot of information encoded in neurons. Some of it can be decoded again in the sleep, so you can recall parts of the experience. But logically analyzed and interconnected is just part of this information. Reading also may be better. Probably you can read up to a few tens of words per second, which is also a bit little, definitely not a gigabyte. Then you have sound, so you can probably process something up to 20 something kilohertz of sound, which means up to, say, 44 kilo samples per second, but it's all pre-analyzed using Fourier transform that is performed within your ear. So actually the information that you get in the end that is logical is much less. Graphics is considered the most bandwidth with friendly, so can very quickly look at the things. Up to certain problems with the resolution of the eyes, so basically in the middle of the eye you see a lot of detail, but in the background you see much less, you probably can process this few megapixel image within a second, at least I get a vague recollection of it later on and understand the basic patterns in there. So for everything else that is beyond this few megapixels, you cannot directly experience it ever. It's just too much. You need to pre-analyze it. You need to write a program to pre-analyze it. You can infer statistics on it, and that's all you can do. Everything that is in larger data sets is mostly hidden from your observation and can be uh, observed only indirectly. If you are a scientist, you can also say that most of the experiments you perform to observe certain facts about the world are also indirect and they have to be, first the data has to be gathered, then the data has to be analyzed. At each of these steps, you indirectly infer something about the other, the previous data or the physical world. And now we have gigabytes of logs, so that's not, not too much seemingly, but it's definitely not the amount that you can process and not easily, not as a human directly. So in bioinformatics, we have very, very simple problem that on the input and on the final output can be relatively small amount of data. So we have a sequence of DNA that is then translated to RNA and then translated, transcribed to protein. Sorry, the other way around. But so the first transcribed, then translated. And uh, the effect of this sequence is the three-dimensional object that's very small, so you cannot observe it directly again. That is protein structure and that decides what is the phenotype of your cells. And the phenotype of your cells, cells uh, affects the phenotype of any individual organism. So we want to discover how this phenotype changes. Why do people have brown eyes, maybe? 
obviously it's according to all research it's mostly uncorrelated with everything else besides the presence of absence in certain climatic zone that forces you to offset the UV index and genetic past which basically means that whatever is the difference <coughs> is being transferred between to, to Europe's springs most of the time and the most interesting parts of this is of course curing diseases Surprisingly, most of the genes that affect your phenotype in a way that they can either affect the phenotype indirectly by affecting uh, the behavior of the pathogen or just making your organisms work differently are very, very old and they bear similarity to our very, very distant ancestors, more like bacteria. So we can infer a lot by just learning a lot about bacteria. The first hypothesis that we use there, or thesis, that is, because we kind of believe it's true most of the time, it's just like Turing thesis, so it's very hard to prove it too wrong, or rather impossible, is that for each uh, protein sequence that we get in the database, that is probably like 150 on average, 130, uh, 300 amino acids, of course it may be up to 10,000 if it's merged after first steps of transcription and translation. So this protein folds to a unique shape that defines its behavior. So that's Anfinsis thesis and that's what we are using to try make purely physical simulation of the proteins and in infer certain facts about phenotypes. So that's how it looks. You get some input with the amino acids marked, uh, marked as letters. Then you produce the structure and from this you can infer how it behaves biochemically. Uh, yeah, I guess if you know Schrodinger equation you can solve it. Uh, of course, we can only solve it for like few atoms now. Maybe with quantum computing, we can have more exact solutions. But anyway, it would be approximation. But we still approximate it. So it's not like certain solutions. It's just certain degree of probability, usually quite low. But it's better than nothing. So basic protein modeling pipeline that you can apply for many proteins is that you take the sequence, then you make iterative so-called profile search that searches for many similar sequences in many different organisms, assesses their uh, similarity all over the tree of organisms, possibly as far as plants go, if it so happens, usually just bacteria. From it, you get a statistical profile, how m often certain amino acids substitute for the others. This profile gives you statistical inference about how important each amino acid is there. You search within protein data bank structures, which are, again, from bacteria through uh, plants to animals and fungi. And you try to use these structures to build your structure and infer how it behaves biochemically later on. And there is a contest which usually gives you about 100 to 100 targets each time. It happens every two years. And people try to approximate the problem the best possible. And for the sequences that are very similar to other sequences, the degree of success is quite certain. For those that are very dissimilar, the probability of complete failure is almost certain. So it's basically inferring the further information from existing databases. Now we can switch completely the background and tell like, how do we think we program? So first we have a we intent. I mean, we want something happening. Then we write something, implement it in some technical solution, most frequently in software because it's easier to work with, but there are other ways to implement it. 
and then we observe results, yeah? That's the simplest way of describing the programming activity. And you can also talk about it as uh, trying to specify desired behavior of the technical solution, exploring the possible technical solutions if you don't know which one will work the best, verifying your assumptions about the world because you can make certain steps and you think that they will produce certain results but when you actually execute them it doesn't happen. Uh, validating uh, hypotheses that are described in computational science or in science that need technical solution to be verified or automating their solution. So you already know how to solve the problem and you have automated. In each of these cases you can say that there are two critical steps in this besides these three I already described. So first you have intent, so you want something, then usually you plan how to achieve it unless you think that you will achieve it by rather random activity which usually doesn't happen then you implement it, then you execute this implementation, and you observe the result. That's a very, very simplified view because you always make steps back. And at each time, you can have different types of problems that you observe. So first, we'll have this intent, so you want something, and you may discover later on that you wanted the wrong thing we will call it wrong specification. The second thing, when you plan, you make a faulty plan, that plan that doesn't really perform, it cannot perform, it misses critical parts possibly. Then we call it a faulty plan or bad algorithm. <laughs> At the third step, when you make an implementation failure, so the plan is perfect, your desire is exactly where it should land, so you exactly know what you want, you can still have a coding error, which means that your program doesn't do what it's expected to do. And you probably will not observe it, this error until you go to the next step, which is execution. So you will find runtime error. And then you will find, oh, I made the error on the previous step. So I need to go to the previous step. <coughs> Sometimes the whole art of debugging errors is to de decide in which class they fall. Because at the final step, when you observe the results, you just observe that there is some discrepancy between intended performance of your program or technical solution and those that you observe, that you, you want, sorry, that you desire. So, if we really want to dissect the debugging process, it, can, it needs to classify the bug, what kind of bug it is. So if you are super optimizing your code and the fault lies in the algorithm, you probably will not go too far, yeah? Or fault lies in the specification that cannot be satisfied. That's also not possible to fix this way. And of course, since our technical solutions are complex and they have to be decomposed hierarchically, we can say that we have this process happening at every level. So first, at the level of the program, that at the level of the, of the module, class or function and so on. The message here is that we have multiple classes of bugs that I enumerated very important part is deciding what class of bugs do we have and isolating it to possibly the smallest part to be able to dissect it. Because it's basically analytical activity here that tries to observe something that is possibly very complex and make sure that it does what we desire. <coughs> so when you are bug fixing, you first try to decide at which level of hierarchy the bug occurs, at which component, which type of the bug it is. 
Is it just small coding error? Is it just uh, insufficient performance? Or is it just the desired behavior that you expect from this part of the code is not possible to attain? And the technical goal is usually have as few bugs as possible, but this is model of the fact that we know that some bugs are much more important than the others. So we want to fix the most important bugs first, as defined by deviation from the desired specification, or deviation in the specification itself from what we really want to have. Thus, we have debug cycle. So we improve our solution by finding what is wrong with it most of the time. And if you have a solution for the problem that is not known to have a solution in the beginning of your PhD, then you realize that this prob problem and this feedback loop has to be repeated very frequently. And a lot of bugs, of bugs need to be fixed in order for you to get a satisfactory technical solution at the end of your PhD, for example, or any other project. In particular, the pipeline that I've been running in the brain informatics field had uh, maybe the data itself was not that large, but definitely not observable. I think it was possible in 70s when there were like 10 or 20 structures in protein data bank that I hear that some people knew them by heart. Now people are just uh, very happy of knowing by heart like 200 most important structures and definitely not in detail. Then you are running this pipeline on say one, 200 targets or on your, of your sample data and you try to not avoid exceptions, you just try to minimize the number unless you know that they should be there. So by exception, you can usually define the deviation from intended control flow in most cases, what you do is that you try to assert that your data is valid every, as a, at every step. So exception should report a discrepancy because bef between the data that you intend at this step and the data that you actually have in this fragment of the program. And you divide your analysis into stages because they take a few hours each stage even with large clusters, as some, sometimes I used actually over 100 machines I don't, at the same time, it takes quite a few hours to, for the result to compute. And at each stage, uh, you save all the data that you already computed so that you are able to analyze them. So the, the, the very example workflow is just some of the steps that are there, first you download the uh, data, then you make first approximations, then you improve, optimize these approximations, make second round of approximations uh, that use more data, and then you rank your approximations by the likelihood that they will be the best ones possible. When you are doing it, and normally the logs take at least few gigabytes. The best way to think about optimizing debugging activity usually is finding root causes. So whatever was the problem with the data at any stage, you had a root cause that made it wrong. Yeah? If this root cause happened, it's not uncommon for it to happen over multiple runs. So you have a set of logs in which you have certain problems occurring repeatedly. So the first thing is you cannot examine these logs. The best part is to process them automatically and classify these bugs. And you try to raise exceptions for everything. So wh why don't we just make a very simple thing? I, I'm sure that even the most beginner, beginners could do it. Just print every exception that is there. And when you, are, you have an exception report in Python, you know that it conforms to a certain format. 
So the secret is if you cut the last line, which is you, you usually uh, contains unique data for this particular run, the exceptions will fall into classes. They will be identical between runs. Then you can count them, infer which of these exceptions happened first, and thus are more likely to, to point to the root cause because the other exceptions may be fell out. So you assume certain ordering in the world of exceptions that happened in any run and assume that the first one is probably more likely than the second one you still want to examine and the 20th one you don't need to examine because it probably fall out of the data problems that you have had first. Of course, that, that assumes that at every step you have some very simple check that may allow you to examine whether data is valid. It is much more practical than checking that the data is valid at the primary input because usually the, the data checks that you can uh, perform at every step are relatively simple operations on simple data. And the data and its relation to the final uh, analysis result is in no way direct, so it's usually impossible to infer it. Yeah? So you cannot just check in more complex cases that the primary data or the first data that you, you get will be wrong. And of course, if you are pointing it to root cause, you would like to generate a new exception, uh, sorry, a new uh, test, test for you, so that you have very, very short library of very short tests, or maybe some of them large. But in the ideal case, it they would be all very short. So every time you change anything about your program, you run them very quickly using PyTest, possibly in parallel, because how, however short they tend to be, they tend, there t tend to be a lot of them to make sure that at least you don't make a regression. In principle, it just prevents you from making regression. If you are disciplined enough in writing these tests, they will also ensure validity of the parts of the algorithm that you can predict, which is probably most of what I couldn't do in this PhD thesis because it was totally unpredictable. <laughs> Actually, my boss quite often referred the project to me, and initially I was not able to find a common uh, schemes between these referrals at different days. But this is just uh, typ typical for this kind of problem in science. Of course, ideally you could have an oracle that just tells you, oh, this is the root cause. But maybe we have almost something like this within the Python itself already. Yeah, we have the exceptions. They point at quite a lot of information. They tell you where they happened. You can add the information about what data caused it. Just need to be clever about it. So you would have, ideally you have, would have a run cycle that you run your software solution on your data as far as possible. You would get uh, the causes of the problems pinpointed automatically, and then you would analyze why they happen and how to fix them. And hopefully, the program would also pinpoint you how to, which of the exceptions are most important, since we know we already have a statistics. This exception ha happened 100 times, and it was always first in the run, and the other exceptions happened only two times and they were unique for the run. <laughs> and then, ideally, we could make them very, very small tests for each of these problems that would just pinpoint to this single problem and run very quickly. So, the simple start. So, you have the function definition, uh, you have assertion that the data is good, and you continue. Maybe the assertion is very basic. Check that alignment has the same number of letters in each of its lines, because it has to be a matrix. Maybe it's something more complex, like the fact that uh, any protein chain has to be continuous. There is certain distance in angstroms between atoms that still yields covalent bond, and any larger distance is probably non-physical. 
but it's still something that you can easily check at this stage and possibly you can never check it at a different stage until you know how the program works, at least. On what is the cause of making huge gaps in the protein structure. So then you gather, gather a lot of these exceptions that pinpoint you to the bugs. The exception format is very simple, as you know in Python. They, it always points you at each module on the path that is involved. It always tells you what kind of the exception was. So you can name your exceptions <laughs> conveniently. And also, the thing to be noticed, even if it's in the innermost very low level function, it will always have this full hierarchy of the things that you wanted to do. So it will point in a unique place in the program code. That's probably something that you all know. Yeah? It's so useful. So now we classify them by the order, which, uh, which is it first exception, is it second, is it hundredth exception in the run. We cut the last line from the trace pack of exception report, and we add things that I will call resumptions that I will talk about in a minute on the next slide. So resumption is a magical device that allows you for each function call that was properly prepared by, by you, to run this function with exactly the same parameters as you had during this program run. So each resumption it basically restores the state from the program run and shows you the function, how the function breaks on it. Also the important part, here I say that there is one resumption for each exception report. That is not necessarily true and what we would like actually to have is to have one resumption for each function in the exception report. So we can pick the most fine-grained function first. If we don't feel that the problem is there, then we go one level up, just like in traceback, and we evoke, invoke another resumption and check what happens. That's called uh, temporal debugging. And in the ideal case, we would have a full time machine here but I think we can do it much simpler in Python. And maybe without full time machine, since generally time machines are expensive, and maybe they have not been built yet in full generality. I I'm sure the scientists are working on it. I'm not saying it's feasible though. And the last thing is that we could have the program that examines the logs and builds our exception report structure that contains all this information. So we have both trace packs that point to unique locations in code. For each trace packs, you have multiple resumptions and you have prioritization for it. And frequency. This program will also point to the frequency of each problem. So the traditional way of handling unpredictable errors in very long runs were checkpoints. So basically the programs in CRY or similar scientific computing operating systems have the special feature that at any point you can stop the program, you can save the whole state of the core, all the open files, all the interactions, all the sockets that are used, and you can resume them. That's very expensive operating system feature, but very useful. Uh, so the difference between checkpoint and resumptions is that in case of resumption, we are able to call this particular function. So it can be used as a unit test, as a minimal unit test that exhibits certain problem. Which if my memory serves well, and if you recall what I said at the previous style, uh, slide, would mean that we have some of the unit tests that are automatically generated after each run, because we know that the exception should not be caused. Of course, we need to filter them later and find those of the resumptions or those of the unit tests that are most important or they are valid tests, instead of those that should just stay Ideally, it would be just a decorator. So each time that we feel like this 
functions should be resumable, should have a resumption produced at each run or each exception, then we should just label it resumable. And that's all the work we should have. And beside that, running the program that analyzes log files after the run. So how do we implement resumptions? Actually, in Python, it's like very, very easy. So I will not give you the decorator tutorial. So first, we have a decorator that has a logger as a parameter. So we know where we write it. Unfortunately, uh, some of the indents here were forgotten. So the wrapped function is indented within the resumable. I'm, I'm not sure why. It's probably a weakness of remark.js. So you have a very simple decorator that does only one thing. It tries to call the function. And if there is exception, it prints a resumption and re-raises the same exception. That's very trivial, yeah? That's very trivial, and you do, don't need to make notes. It's all on the GitHub. So how do you print resumptions? Is it something complex in Python? Of course. I would not say it, because in Python, everything is simple, yeah? <laughs> everything you really need to do can be implemented in not very complicated way. So what resumption needs to do is just save all inputs for the function. Identify what is the function called. <coughs> Save this exception as a comment so you know why this unit test failed in this particular run in case when you run it on your own machine, you don't find the exception to be ever raised. That, that's not uncommon in scientific computing. That means that some admin has to do their job again, or at least switch the machine so you don't get broken runs for a while until he fixes it. Actually, the, the second part is more important. So for every, every big clustering or grid solution or AWS, you always have some person ma machines that are switched off, even though they seem to be working, but you don't get the results that you desire from them. So very simple. You get func code by the meta object protocol from Python. And on this code, you check the var names, which are variable names that are given. A call arc count filters it to the uh, variable names that are actually used as a function, function arguments. Then you make sure that it works for both normal arguments, like positional ones and keyword arguments. That's how I assign these var names to the arguments and take them all together. And for each of them, you store the current argument. And this is the probably most hairy part. So for built-in types of Python, you cannot define the store method easily. So you need to enumerate them. And since they usually are simple, and for strings or ints, you can just print representation of them. And that's as good as saving it to text that file, since you are planned to execute a resumption as a Python script anyway. For your classes that may hold something more complex and possibly large data structure, I do recommend either saving it as a pickle if you don't want to examine it, or if you are like me and you have, for example, protein data bank format as a structure, you just make sure that you use this function from the library that saves this particular object in a correct format that can be examined by some other application that allows you to view it. So in my case, I always saved it back as PDB file and always examined it in appropriate molecular software. So this is just adding a method to any object that you think needs to be saved in a custom way. If it doesn't, then if it's built in, it's, its representation is used. If it's not built in, there will be a pickle. And that works for everything but those things like open files that cannot be pickled. There are not many of them that you really want to have as arguments that need to be resumable. Provided that you save your data after each step, of course. 
And the last thing, you check what is qualified name of the function. When I implemented it first time in Python, I think 2.3 or 2.4, uh, it was not yet available. Luckily, now it is, which makes sure that if you start your resumption within the same uh, module structure or directory level where you have your program modules, it should work as a qualified name. You just need to import everything. But that, that can be added easily either. And then you print it to the logger. So it's like the most trivial Python program here. I'm really ashamed that I'm presenting it here. But I'm not sure if anybody else has made sure that his unit tests are generated automatically after he reads the data. So maybe it is useful. So the example resumption is here. It's just a unit test without checking any assertions. You just take the arguments. In this case, they are both representations. And, uh, oh no, sorry. There are two of them are representation. Instead, is alignment which is read from file. And you call the function. That means that your debug cycle if you have your data, if you have preliminary implementation without any test, consists of just running the program and checking uh, what is the best level at which you want the unit test to happen. So for each exception trace, you are able to usually to define one or two resumptions that will check this particular problem. Of course, in cases where you can predict how the unit test should behave, you probably don't need it that much. But if you cannot predict what is lies in the data, if it has not been fully specified, it's probably a better approach. The other thing is that I'm not sure if you frequently use like commercially, commercial grade specifications or military grade specifications are actually more, more famous for it. I'm not sure if you read any military grade specification. There are a lot of them on, on the internet. I'm not saying that they usually point to the problem, because that's not true. They, they have to be kind of prepared to predict every situation. And I'm sure that you can very frequently write a program that satisfies the specification than to read the specification itself. And that may be a point that we want also to optimize the time spent on writing unit tests. Unless we really, really are absolutely sure that we didn't make the bug one. So that we are absolutely 100% sure that our, what we want from our program is really exactly what we'll, we should get from it to be satisfied. Unfortunately, it's, it's not so of frequently seen in real life. Also, it uses a lot of dynamic typing because it kind of relies on the feature that you get your error delayed until you actually check for it, you can check for it. So for example, when you know that certain atoms should be in a chain and should have a covalent bond, then it's easy to check for it. But there are also things where the typing <laughs> would help, but also make sure, would, would make it less apparent why the problem happens. So in a way, that was a novel dev software development practice because it was not like completely disordered way of writing unit tests or writing the software at all just by looking by with eyeballs how does it perform. At the same time, most of the unit tests were not written, written by any human. They were driven by the actual data that was presented to the program. And I think we are getting more and more of it. So in most cases in biology, it's very, very hard to predict the universe of the available data. And it seems that we are looking at this problem more and more into data science. So actually, the first thing you can do is to try to statistically assess what is the universe of your data. And as long as you are progressing with the project, usually you have a different opinion about your universe after each month. Or if your debug cycle is shorter, then it's much better. 
but it will still change. It's just every week, yeah? Or every year, if you are in a bad situation. The next issue that we could try to address is how to automatically pick the level at which we uh, find the test, yeah? Because we still have alternative resumptions here. And then, if you know what, what is to be desired here, please implement it. I don't have an idea yet. It allows you to quickly explore hypotheses. So it's strictly in the spirit of purely exploratory programming. It's assumingly biologist got his first Python 101 tutorial. He doesn't really know what is to be desired here. He doesn't really know what the program should do because it's still open problem in science. Sometimes it so happens. But he still wants to pr make program that would try to solve the problem. And then you can validate hypothesis very, very quickly because a lot of software development process is done for you. So you automatically isolate parts of the uh, test. You automatically downsize the test to the smallest possible unit. Okay, now it's time for QA. Yeah? Okay, I just want to make, uh, this is a really interesting idea. I just want to make sure I've got the, the gist of this correct. So, what these resumptions are effectively, let, they let us generate unit tests that basically say, given this input that my, that my system had, I don't make an error. I don't produce an error when I run the function. Right? We're not making any assertions about the behavior of the function's output. We're just saying it shouldn't cause an error. And, and yes. that lets us hone in on uh, a likely, a more likely more correct solution because at least each of these component parts isn't producing invalid data. It's not raising it. Yes. Okay. So what you want to add to this is, of course, a lot of suggestions about validity of your data at every step, including just the end of the program. Right. Okay, I assume I either was boring or most people were interested in something else or it was so fascinating that nobody has anything to add here. But please ask me about, yeah? yeah um, typically, you would be treating as a big data. But I, well, from examples I see, I, I'm not very sure how big data is, is associated with the problem. So I can tell you, genomes are usually measured between megabases and gigabases. So they are not that large anymore. But they are complex, so any analysis you do on genomes requires you to match usually all against all genes that you may have in your set. Yeah, I understand the big data perspective in the molecular biology and genome sciences, but uh, how does it associate with the specific problem you are having? Like, you're debugging the <coughs> basically uh, see a problem. So since we are not sure so what do you have uh, maybe in mathematics that you have two test cases or four test cases on a particular theorem, a single one that you want to prove? Here we have a universe of protein and say in hu humans maybe you have a bit more genes. The minimal genome is actually about 300 genes, which means with some alterations and variations you can produce 300 basic proteins. Most of the organism has at least a few tens of thousands of them, of different proteins. They also have a lot of variations, for example, in the immune system. And each of them has a different structure that you need to infer. So to just assess the universe of the data here, it's possible to say it in numeric terms, but it's impossible to state any statement that would be true for all proteins, including the statement that I just made, which is that there are so and so many of them. I'm not joking. So basically, if you say protein is always trans translated from RNA, yeah, 
at some point there is some translation process, but there may be also gluing. The RNA is always transcribed for DNA. That's not true. So you have some data. You have, say, terabases of information in, uh, about different organisms. You try to match it up. You are not sure how much data is you are missing. Because in principle, genetic code should contain all the information you need to infer the phenotype. That is also not true, actually. You need epigenetic code. So you are just getting some kind of slice of the world that happens to have terabases. <coughs> and the complexity of the system inside is such that you need to deal with it as big data. So basically, the only way to make inference there is statistical or probabilistic. So it's beyond your analytical capability to do it either directly by observation, by direct sensory experience, nor by any simple and always valid statistics. So simply counting will not help. Simply making a database will not make sense. There are as many different uh, statistical methods of trying to find a similar gene. As I can tell, pairwise comparisons or pure algorithms never work. So it's always inferring certain relations, probabilistically. And because of the nature of the process, you always need to do it, do it each against each, which actually means that for any genome with megabases, you have uh, the square of it in terms of information. Approximately, potentially, at least. Okay, hour. Yeah, yeah, so, sure.